Hello, I'm Charlie Rossiter, and welcome to Poetry Spoken Here on YouTube. We're the longest-running all-poetry interview podcast in existence. Be sure to subscribe to the channel so you never miss an upload. But you don't have to wait for YouTube uploads. You can also download the show from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Enjoy the show. I'm Charlie Rossiter, and this is Poetry Spoken Here. Our feature today is Kristen Latour. A much-published poet from Aurora, Illinois, she teaches at Joliet Junior College. She was born in Arizona, lived and taught for a time in Texas, and now finds herself in the northern Midwest. Then I'll be joined by Wes Mongo Jolly, who's working with a group of dedicated volunteers on the Performance Poetry Preservation Project. It's a project that is well on its way to creating an accessible online recorded archive of the history of the Poetry Slam. I'm Charlie Rossiter, and this is Poetry Spoken Here. Our guest today is Kristen Latour. She has two master's degrees, one of which she got at the University of Duluth, with an emphasis in women's studies. She's got a brand new book called What Will Keep Us Alive. We're going to be talking about that book and hearing poems from it. Kristen, I'm so glad you could be here today. Thank you. It's great to be here this morning. And uh, this new book, What Will Keep Us Alive, tell me about it. It's a long time in coming, I think. I have friends who have spent longer on manuscripts and getting them published, and this one... It started after I got my master's degree in 2007 and I kept putting together poems and putting together poems and getting rejected and getting rejected and after a while of spending money on submission fees and I took a break for about a year and I went um, to AWP, the American Writers Programs um, Conference and I was part of a reading with a lot of other women publishers. And after the the reading, Erin Elizabeth Smith, who is involved with Sundress Publications, came up to me and she said, I'd really like to see a manuscript of yours. And I said, oh, great. That would be great. <laughs> and um, I went home and I started from scratch and looked at all the poems I had. I wrote some new ones and I organized mm-hmm. it and sent it to her. And, and she accepted it, which was lovely. The, is are there um, is there one big theme to the book, or are there a couple of themes? When I first started, when I put the manuscript together and sent it to her, um, the way that I had it organized was like from childhood to adulthood. So the poems that were more about children at the beginning, the poems that were more about older age towards the end, um, and as we worked on the manuscript. Um, we talked about different ways to organize it, that that wasn't really working. And so I, after a couple of ways of trying and it wasn't working, I did it by regions of places where I've lived or have spent time. So the whole first section is more about the desert. The middle section is more about the Midwest. And the third section is more about the East Coast, where I haven't lived, but I've spent a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So that's how roughly how it's organized. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. And one of the poems here um, that you showed me recent that I saw called Moving West. Um, and I already knew from your resume that you lived in Arizona and Texas and other places. Um, I'm wondering if we could try something. I haven't done this before mm-hmm. on Poetry Spoken Here. If you'd talk us through the poem before you read it. Like, what's going on in this poem? It's a story. It is a story. And um, how about if you... Tell us a story and then read us the poem. Okay. I'm just going to make sure I don't leave anything out. So this poem is, it's loosely based on things that are true. There is some truth to it, as always. And there's, a lot of it is lies. Um, My parents came, went from Lorain, Ohio, close to Cleveland, to Tucson, Arizona. My dad was in the Air Force and he got stationed in Arizona. So they drove, um to move out there. They drove from Ohio to Arizona and 
and settled there. And it was very different. Tucson is very, very different from Lorain, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and my parents have always told stories about what it was like going to that place. You know, what my mother expected it to be like, what what um, it was like living in this small city at that time um, when they were living there and the things that they could find that were similar to what they had had in Ohio and things that were completely different. So that's the grain of truth, these people moving. So the story is these two people, this couple leaves Ohio, they drive to Arizona, they get there, and for the woman, the life is not what she expected it to be and she struggles while she's there. Um, and in the end, she has to come to terms with things that are much different than what she expected they would be. Does that, is that a good story? Yeah. <laughs> Did yeah. I tell the story yeah. in a roundabout way? Well, I think so. Well, we have, so that's a general notion of what's going on. Okay, so uh, how about if we hear it in poetic form? Okay. Um, one of the things, I wrote this this summer um, and I was having some, some health issues and as I was going through those health issues, I was doing a lot of soul searching so that I think that soul searching comes out in this poem too. It wasn't, this was one of those poems that, um, I needed to read, um, over and over again and write with the idea that it was going to fit into the book. So it yep. wasn't. It was a newer poem. All right. Moving west. She packed her cauldron, the dried woodland flowers, the cat's tail in a secret suitcase. The car headed west from land that smelled of iron ore, septic rivers. She nodded, napped, dreamed of lithe blue birds as tall as ostriches, sand in dunes and crevices laying flat against horizons of red rock. Each stop was more plateau-like. Illinois's barely hills of coal, Missouri's glacial mounds, Oklahoma's wasteland. They slept under the canopy of a chevette, rocked by the wind, rain or still as a casket. She murmured spells when he entered her, under trees, the roots taking his seed into their veins, blessing their spring branches with abundant blossoms. When they arrived in the summer Sonoran heat, she found the suitcase was empty, but her lover swore on her breast he knew nothing less than that. She went to the barrio and found only clay pots for sale, decorative and gaudy, just Mexican oregano, sage, yucca flowers. She couldn't abide lying under creosote or Palo Verde, so she and her lover took to clean muslin sheets on a spring bed that sang songs like sea shanties as they came together. Her murmurs slurred, made her incantations meaningless garble under an adobe roof. It wasn't long before her womb closed. The Midwestern spells she memorized slipped into unlabeled envelopes. Her hands forgot how to move over a steaming pot, were blistered more than once. She seasoned everything with chilies. The baby was born while she lay on her back without friends to support a standing birth. It cried in colic and frustration at the spice in its mother's milk. She wanted to cover it in tattoos of what remaining spells she recalled. Cactus needles were useless and her ink wouldn't stay black. That's certainly different than the brief prose summary <laughs> of the story. It is. I left out the witchcraft part. Yeah. <laughs> My mother is not a witch. She did not have spells, and I promise I am. I was born in Tucson. I am not covered in tattoos of, of spells. Okay. That's a little <laughs> disappointing, but, but okay. That's why poetry maybe is more fun than prose. Yeah, yeah. So but what I was thinking of this before we were talking about, the idea that poets prefer to tell the story in a poem, in a poem form. I do. And where do you think that comes from? I think it comes from a, an economy of words and that you can, I mean, you can write science fiction. You can be completely out there. Yeah. But I think if I was to write a story where a woman tattooed her baby, like the, people would just not 
go with that. But in a poem, I can I can get away with that, mm-hmm. or um, to move so quickly through what's a very long, boring trip. I mean, it's if you right. do it once, it's exciting. But the trip from from Tucson to to Lorraine is not an no. exciting trip if you do it over and over again. So I think yeah. by compacting that and making it smaller, I, I get to just do all the interesting parts. <laughs> yeah. Well, everything is 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 uh, more intense, heightened, you mm-hmm. might say. Yeah. So that yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What do you tell that you teach? What do you tell students makes a good poem? I tell them that it it depends, kind of like music, that it depends something on your taste. There are always going to be things that people like and and don't like, um, but some things are just not poems, and and other things are so I think poems need imagery and they need sound and they need a compactness even epic poems are short like you read an epic novel and it's girthy like you know you've picked up an epic novel but when you read an epic poem it's still concise there's a conciseness to it so and musicality, you know, and I think that comes through the sound. Sometimes, sometimes it's just word choice, and sometimes mm-hmm. it's meter, and sometimes it's rhyme. Um, and if the if all you're getting is the musicality, then you're not getting a whole poem. You need all of those things together, working in harmony, to really get to a, a good poem. That'd be a way of elevating the level. If we were going to judge poems, elevating the level, of how many of those components. Are functioning well, functioning together. Yes. The rhythm, yeah. the sound, the story, whatever it is, or right. the image, whatever it is. I think so. I think that's the case, and I think it has to. It can't be forced either. It needs to be. It, the The best poems to me are the ones that you don't realize something is happening at all until you go back and you read it again and again and again. You go, oh, there's a rhyme with that line three. Right. Three lines back. Those right. words rhyme or half right. rhyme or something like that. And why? Why did they do that? And I think too, that's another sign of a good poem when it when it needs more than one rereading, or you can go back and you can find something new in it, or it, over time it meet, the meaning changes for the reader. I think yeah. that's good too. As with visual art, the first time you look at it, fine. Mm-hmm. But but then if you look again, you see more things. Yes. Or, Something below the surface, perhaps, yeah. or deeper. Yeah. I think so. Okay, how about giving us another poem from... Uh, what would you like to hear? How about the title poem, the which, title which poem. I notice says, What Will Keep Me Alive? It or is. Or did you change that? And What Will Keep Us Alive is Let the title of the book. What Will Keep Us Alive is the title of the book. Let me find the poem. Well, that's more inclusive for the potential reader. That it makes is. rhetorical sense, I think. Yes, and in the book, it's What Will Keep Us Alive is the title poem, and okay. it's, it's way towards the back. The original title was What Will Keep Me Alive, mm. and I had many discussions with my editor about that. Mm. I see the book as being very personal, but there's not a lot of first-person poems in the book. Mm-hmm. And that was confusing for her. So as... We talked about it. I was like, oh, I see why that's confusing. So, yeah, let's change it to us. Because really the book is more about uh, a we than it is about me. So, I, I think so. Again, I would think that might be a quality of better poems. I think so. You know, I mean, you do write it about yourself. But the idea is, you all know what I'm talking about. Or you've all had this experience right, too. Right, that universality like of, of things. Yeah. yeah, and not to discount, I mean, there are a lot of poets who write only in that eye, but it, it tends to mean something to more people than just that one person. So, this is what will keep us alive. Even the worms that push to the surface in spring extol the wonders of ground thaw, sun pushing downward through the dirt. It's generosity, the robins must think, as a buffet spreads before them, who subsisted on dry berries. Everything happens in accordance, as Thoreau found in his walks around Walden, noting the temperature, the blooming dates of bladderworts and saxifrage, the time that buttercups and asters went to seed. How extravagant, even the simple unfolding of a bud this time of year. The robins note it as they search for twigs and grass to build a crib. 
how much we want to remain a watcher of unleafed branches, an evader of taxes, listening to the trill of red-winged blackbirds. So would you say, I love a reference to Thoreau. <laughs> automatically, <laughs> automatically like the poem better when Thoreau gets mentioned. <laughs> I actually went to Walden a couple years ago oh. and I didn't know that he had kept all, track of all this stuff. Like he kept lists of all the flowers and when they mm. bloomed in the trees and when they had fruit on them and it's, it was interesting to me. I thought he just kind of hung out there. And, oh. But he kept dedicated lists of things. <laughs> so, so what keeps us alive? Well, this is a springtime poem, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got the, the ground thawing and the birds coming and building their nests and um, an allusion to taxes, which is a springtime thing. Um, I think if we lived all the time in winter, we wouldn't do so well surviving or we'd turn crazy like Norwegians writing about zombie Nazis and, and okay. death and murder. <laughs> cabin fever. Huh? Yes, Big cabin time. fever that we need, okay. we need springtime and we need to know that that's coming and it's not just the seasons but in our moods that you know, you, if you suffer from depression, which mm -hmm. I do, you need to know that there's going to be a time where things are going to get better or else you, you don't keep existing if you mm -hmm. don't believe that something is going to come that's going to be better. Um, and I think that the birds know that too, that they know that they need food, right? They know that they need to procreate, that they will not keep going if they don't eat and and build their nests. So I think that more than food. If you're hungry, you can be hungry for a while if you know that food is coming. When no food comes, that's when there's a problem. So it's that that time that you're waiting for and that's what keeps us going. If you can believe those. Now, of course, if you don't eat after a while, you're not going to be alive. Yeah. But, but knowing that that is coming and the promise of it coming will keep us going. Yeah, okay. Now. Another one, speaking of, well, not quite depression, but we have the counting her sorrows. Oh. That's an interesting, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting poem. Uh, where did it start, counting her sorrows? Because you know, I... the number of sorrows, the first line says she rode her dozen sorrows to the center of the lake. And I remember right when I read that, I said, why, why was it a dozen? And then I read the rest of the poem and I got the idea <laughs> of what it was going to lead to, but it's still interesting. Where, where in the world did that come from? Well, since I already said I, I, depression mm -hmm. is one of my maladies, so um, I think I think it comes from a personal place, but I think too that there's just many people who have that. Like you just, you have these troubles, whatever they are, family sure. troubles, money troubles, work troubles, kids, whatever, and and you want to get rid of these problems. You want to find a way to alleviate mm -hmm. whatever this problem is. So this woman, this character's idea is that she will kill them off. But you can't kill off your, your problems, right? You can, you can shred all your bills. You can turn off your phone. <laughs> but eventually bad things are going to happen and it will get, get worse. Mm -hmm. So when you try to ignore your problems, they just get worse. So that's what happens to this woman is that she keeps counting and every time she tries to do away with her sorrows, they come back. Multiplied. Multiplied many times over until she has so many of them that um, she's at her wits, her wits end. And it's a fun way too. It's a fun way to think about something really terrible. Which I agree. Is, and, and then the idea... The, the idea of it also shows something you can do that you would do in a poem mm -hmm. by coming up with this idea of the count, which we'll let you read the poem because okay. people don't know quite totally what we're talking about. Okay. And, and I think the way, the way you did that is just, it was just a great device to make the point. <laughs> so this is counting her sorrows. She rode her dozen sorrows to the center of the lake, pushed them each overboard, hoping they'd drown, but they floated grew arms or fins and swam in the wake back to shore, shook the wet from their skin. They clambered into her car, blank stares and ahems the whole way home. 
She walked her 24 sorrows to the ocean-battered cliff, tossed them off one by one, but they boomeranged back faster than her arm could throw, and counting them as they huddled at her feet, she sighed, led the slow parade back over the hill to her darkened home. She packaged her 36 sorrows in brown cardboard boxes, wrapped in brown paper, tied with white twine. She licked 36 stamps and addressed the labels to prisoners at the island penitentiary. The boxes were traced back to her door where they were delivered, smashed and full of hungry, squinting sorrows, only more. She boarded her 48 sorrows on the train that crossed mountains, savannas, valleys covered in snow, arranged them in reclining seats with cups of tea and one shortbread cookie each. She took a long rope, laced it between them as they munched and slurped, took the other end with her off the train just before the conductor shut it tight. She tied the rope around her slender waist, held her breath, closed her eyes. I just really like that poem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I get the visual of her too on the train. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you can see a cart version of this poem yes that some you know video person can get into yes and uh, you can just see the way that works she's gonna do away with herself and all of them if she can yes there you go. Yeah. yeah yeah i like that they each get a shortbread cookie you can just see them all sitting yeah. tiny they're small they're not large things she can pick them up and put them on a seat give them a mm -hmm. cup of tea and a cookie and they're all sitting there mm -hmm. <laughs> dealing with life yes Poetry helps you deal with life. Yes. What do you, don't, what do you, don't do that, though. Don't tie a rope around your waist. And, no. No. There are better ways to deal with life. Much, much, uh, much, much. What, what do you tell students when you, when you want to uh, tell them, like a kid comes in and isn't particularly into poetry, your course just fit his schedule, as you said, sometimes. <laughs> I had a free hour at 10 o'clock, so right. I'm here. Uh, yep. what, what do you tell them they might help them get into poetry? Well, I try to, to be where they are at first. And all of us, almost all of us, started in childhood reading or learning songs that had these catchy little rhymes in them. Mm -hmm. And when you were a child, you learned a lot of things through poetry, like a rhyme on how to tie your shoes. Or you learned... Um, I, we learned things through our poetry. And... Kids love Dr. Seuss, and they love Shel Silverstein, and they love music yeah. and songs that are poetry. And then you get to be, I don't know when it happens, maybe like junior high where you have to start studying poetry and your teachers start, like, you will write a sonnet and you're going to write haiku. And I have friends who do this, and they do a great job with it, but not all teachers do a great job with this. Mm -hmm. And suddenly poetry is difficult and challenging and hard, and by the time you get to college, you're so distanced from whatever love you had of poetry when you were a child that now you just think it's hard and boring and difficult. So most of my students listen to music, and a lot of them listen to good music. Like, it's not just the pop, mm -hmm. you know, it has a beat I can dance to it. They listen to some good musicians who write excellent lyrics. So we start there with lyrics and pulling out poetry and lyrics. And then I, I bring them to poems that I love um, and hope that my enthusiasm is contagious. Mm -hmm. And then as we work our way through the semester, we get to more and more challenging things. Name a poem you love, just for the hell of it. A poem I love. I love, and I have to, I'm bad at memorizing poems because I have to remember all my students' names. And so mm. I, I spend my brain energy on that. That's so a, um, The title is enough. <laughs> the title is enough. <laughs> sure. How about I describe a poem? Um, there's a poem I love, and it's about the letter P, and it's about plums, and how plums are, the metaphor is that plums, eating a plum is like kissing, mm. because you have to gently bite into the plum you have to suck the juice out of the plum i mean it's a sexy sexy poem and my students Great. i love to show it to my <laughs> students because they're like this Whoa. is a, this is a poem about a plum but it's about kissing and this is weird and i'm like okay the next time you eat a plum pay attention and they're 
then they get freaked out like they're never going to eat plums again. They're afraid of plums. Yes, they're going to have to eat them alone in their bedrooms. They're not going to be able to ever eat a plum in front of anyone again. Well, uh, we probably got time for you to read another poem. Do you have okay. something you'd particularly uh, like to read? Oh, I get to. I wasn't. From the book? I wasn't prepared to read something oh, well, that you, I get you to. You know pick. what you like. I do. Yeah. Um, Great. I like. Well, of course, I should like all the poems in the book. Oh, sure. I like why the Garcias never attended the circus after oh. 1942. Cool. I wasn't even, Charlie happens to have that open in front of him. I wasn't cheating. I didn't look over there until after I chose this. Um, and this is another one that has like a grain of truth to it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it's made up. Great eight, I'm sorry. Great Aunt Esperanza, tired of the South Texas sun and her job at her father's dusty grocery. The feel of tomatoes she piled in pyramids and the dumb numbers on the register. All the boring Catholic boys wanted to fix engines and make babies, not the ruckus that ran in her veins. She snuck away with a carny one May, came back 10 autumns later with tattoos of cherry petals on her cheeks, stories of trapeze artists who swung her glittering heart. She scrubbed elephant hides with long brushes before the parades through small Midwestern towns. Her hair spangled with the confetti of water from the clown's water pails. Brushing cobwebs off her old bed frame, she stuffed her mattress with sawdust and popcorn, tried to have dreams of girls in pink on milk-white horses, drank only icy lemonade. Ran away and did someone actually run away and join the circus? I do. I have. My grandmother told me about this, that she had an, an aunt who did this she ran away and joined the circus and came back years later and people were just kind of astounded she did have tattoos but i they were not on her face um uh -huh. so i just thought that would be pretty to have cherry petals on your cheeks oh yeah so and yeah so that's the grain of truth um the rest of it's pretty much all made up but and i love the idea of sleeping on a mattress with sawdust and popcorn it would just smell <laughs> like the circus wouldn't it sawdust right. and popcorn yeah. would smell like the circus you got it yeah Again, a quick, concise image conveys the, the yeah. big idea. Yeah. Big idea. Yeah. And I think a lot of us romantic. I think we romanticize this, like running away with someone, whether it's running mm -hmm. away to the Bahamas or running away with the circus. Yeah. We, we dream of this. What would it be like? And, and often, I think we're told in, in our mythology that it's, it's never better. It's not good. Mm -hmm. But this woman had a wonderful time. You know, she came back and... and and she was satisfied, it seems like. And she was ready to adapt to this life that she didn't like before. You know, that now, yeah. she's, now she's in a okay. place where she's okay. She's okay. Well, it's nice to end on a really nice positive story like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Successfully Absolutely. running away and joining the circus. Yes, yes. I'm living to tell about it. Absolutely. I'm glad you could do this. Person. Thank this you really so neat. much, Charlie. I'm so All glad right. I came. Thank you. I'm Charlie Rossiter. This is Poetry Spoken Here. Mungo Jolly. And we're going to talk to him about this project he's got going called the Performance Poetry Preservation Project. And right off, Mungo, why don't you just say a few words about what that is? <laughs> well, it's great to talk to you, Charlie. Uh, yeah, let me tell you a little bit about P4. Uh, the, po the Poetry Slam movement is what we're focusing on. And basically, the Poetry Slam movement has been around for about 25 years now. And we feel like it's a really important kind of cultural and historical event that's kind of been going on for so long that we wanted to try to capture before it goes away. Because as you know, uh, <laughs> uh, recordings of, uh, of poetry or recordings of anything that, that, that start getting more than about five or 10 years old start beginning to disappear. So we feel like we're in this window right now where we've got the, uh, the ability and the opportunity to collect so many of these recordings that have been happening all over you know, poetry slams all over the country. Yeah. So what our goal is, is that we're trying to go out to these venues that have been recording these things, grab these recordings, whether they're on VHS or whether they're on cassette tape or whether they're on computer files, get them all in, bring them into a single repository, get them all digitized to some standards and then apply some preservation to them. So uh, eventually when we, we get all the material in that we're expecting to get in, we expect to have probably one of the largest archives of spoken word poetry in the world. It's gonna have thousands and thousands of hours of recorded poetry from poetry slams all over the world actually. 
So uh, it, it's a fairly big project and a fairly large uh, undertaking. Uh, the, the main way we're approaching it is this idea that the Poetry Slam movement is the people that know this material best and they're the people that can collect and index it properly. But we also want to partner with a repository institution like a large college uh, library or, uh, or a large uh, uh, you know, public library, somebody that can actually be the technical repository for the material and then leave it to us, leave it to the Poetry Slam movement to be able to actually get the material, get it indexed, get it properly uh, yeah. uh, uh, into, the, into the repository. So that's basically what we're trying to do. Pretty simple project in a way, but I think it's also got the possibility of becoming a, 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 a huge um, uh, resource, not only for the Poetry Slam uh, community, the people that are inter interested in this as, as, uh, yeah. as a poetry, as an art form, but also for all sorts of other academic disciplines, whether it's sociology or politics or pretty much anything, women's studies, you know, the Poetry Slam really reflects the zeitgeist of the community of the time. So looking at the Poetry Slam that was done in San Francisco 25 years ago, is going to be very different from looking at the poetry slam that's being done in middle America today. So I think we have yeah. the op opportunity for humanists and all sorts of different disciplines to be able to mine this material for some really interesting, uh, some really interesting content. How long have you been at this? Yeah, we've actually been we've been incorporated as a nonprofit for about three years now, I think it is. And uh, we've done a ton of work on the back end. What we're trying to do is build the infrastructure, which is more complicated than you might think. So we're doing things like working out the legal arrangements for copyright issues. And we're doing stuff like being able to uh, figure out the indexing strategy, what kinds of fields we need to be able to index it and how we'll be able to do the technical standards. So there's, there's a ton of really technical work on the back end to build the repository before we can actually start bringing in content so we're, we're working on that but at the same time we're also getting <laughs> uh, every time we, we go out and talk about this I get a phone call from somebody that says oh I'm a, in a poetry slam over here and I've got this shoebox full of recordings that I'd love to be able to get to you and people start sending us this stuff so we're already having a fairly large collection of material on media uh, but the goal and what we're really after is to get that stuff all digitized into a digital repository as opposed to leaving it all on the media where it's inaccessible. What we have, if you look at our website, we've actually got kind of a catalog that shows the kinds of uh, recordings we have and where they've come from. Uh, it's just a, basically a spreadsheet that shows kind of uh, all, of, all of the <laughs> material we have, but none of it's been digitized yet in a place that, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's accessible. We've done a lot of experiments where we've digitized sets of content, like we digitized 500 pieces recently and then sent those out to a set of indexers to do a, a a test indexing run on it to see how well that worked Great. and uh, got some pretty good interesting results from that but uh, none of that's publicly accessible yet that's the goal we want to get there how did are, are you a slammer or an ex-slammer? How did you get involved? I'm a poet, but I'm more of a poetry promoter. <laughs> My background is primarily in uh, in podcasting, I think, as, as you as you are. Uh, so I've been running a podcast for uh, almost 10 years now. It's called the Indie Feed Performance Poetry Channel, where I featured, oh God, I think we now are at about almost 600 different poets and 1,600 different episodes that we put out over the last decade. So in that process, I've come to know uh, slammers. It's primarily slam, but it's a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of spoken word from other uh, genres as well. But in that process, I've got to know slammers and slam scenes all over the country. And this is the uh, getting to know all those different <laughs> different needs out there to, is kind of how I got into creating this project. Yeah, I'm, I'm imagining uh, in a way that the early slams are, are not heavily recorded. I guess by comparison, now it seems. Lots of people, every little open mic you know, records and puts yeah, it up on YouTube yeah. and whatever. Yeah, it's true, actually. Some of the earlier slams, they either weren't recorded or they were recorded kind of in, in, um, in just in passing. Uh, I know that there are lots of slams out there where just somebody in the audience had a, had a cassette tape recorder and happens to have a recording of a slam from, you know, you know 1998. Oh, yeah. And they just it's just sitting on a cassette tape somewhere. And those are the, the really valuable ones. Uh, Taylor Molly, who's a, a poet in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in New York, sent me some of the early recordings of the Urbana Slam from, I think, about 1999, 2001, somewhere around there. And it was amazing. These were some of the early people that before they ever got big uh, that did these kind of little slams in the basement of CBG. <laughs> it's like, wow, these are just amazing recordings. So they're all on mini discs of, of all things. So this, th those yeah. kind of little treasures are all over out there and we just want to grab them before they go away. So uh, what would happen next or somebody listening to this who's interested, how can they find out more or keep tabs on you or whatever? Well, I'd say to go right now, go over to our website. It's poetrypreservation.org. 
that's a place to, to keep track of what we're doing. There's all sorts of links there. If you've got material you want to send our way, or if you're just interested in volunteering, or you're interested in just keeping track of what we're up to, there's a mailing list you can sign up for there. Uh, and you get a, this, get a pretty good sense of where we are with that. And hopefully, uh, when we start actually making material available through our archive, that's going to be the portal to get into it. All right. And when you say we, just as we close, who el who else is the we uh, uh, well <laughs> there's actually a surprising number of people involved we have a board of oh. directors with four people on it oh. uh it's myself chris no keep after uh, tom boulain uh, marty mcconnell and um, and karen garibrand are the four people that are all and they're all people in the poetry slam who's if you're right. familiar with the slam you recognize a lot of those names uh, and they're all the, the board of directors, but we also have supporters in a lot of the major slams across the country. So people like Mark Smith and Bob Holman and Gary Glazner, they're the people that know what we're doing and are kind of behind the scenes cheering us on and helping us with some of our major decision making oh, when they come up. And then we've got a whole cadre of people that are working on the technical side. We've got librarians and we've got people that are interested in um, oral history that are helping us with some of the technical work that we're doing on the back end as well. So it's kind of spidered out into a real uh, community effort that involves a lot of people. Great. Hey, well, it's been really good talking to you. This is a wonderful project. I'm really happy we can just help spread the word about it. Uh, Great. Get more people into what you're doing. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate the chance to talk to you. And uh, again, if you the, the website is poetrypreservation.org. And if anybody wants to write to me directly, uh, go ahead and write to me at mongo at poetrypreservation.org. There you go. We've been talking to Wes Mongo Jolly. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye. You've been listening to Poetry Spoken Here. I'm Charlie Rossiter, inviting you to join us again next time to let poetry speak to you. Music for today's program was written and performed by Jack Rossiter Monley. And remember, Poetry Spoken Here is more than a podcast. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash poetry spoken here. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash poetry spoken here. For more about today's show and other Poetry Spoken Here podcasts, as well as our blog, just visit our website, poetryspokenhere.com. If you'd like to submit suggestions of poets or topics for future podcasts, you can send to our email address, poetryspokenhere at gmail.com.